Fight Corner from the mecca of mixed martial arts, Las Vegas. Here are your hosts, Heidi Fang, Phil Divine, and Joey Varner. Hey, this is Mike Goldberg, voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and you are listening to the MMA Fight Corner. Here we go! Here we go! All right, welcome to a very special Tuesday, uncensored, unedited, extremely live, and hopefully under control with Joey V version <laughs> of the MMA Fight Corner. Guys, we are uh, we're here live in the Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're doing this live online. This is going to be a very special Tuesday edition of the MMA Fight Corner. We're preempted this evening on Sports 920 uh, in Las Vegas due to some 51s baseball, the Las Vegas 51s, who are actually doing a heck of a job right now and uh, winning a lot of baseball games so congratulations to them but we've still got a great show we're going to break down UFC on Fox 8 we're going to look ahead in Joey V's coach's corner to UFC 163 and we're also going to recap one of the most exciting nights of fighting that we've had here in Las Vegas in quite some time possibly since the last UFC fight and that was Lion Fight 10 this last Friday night over at the joint inside the Hard Rock so for your host Joey Varner Phil Devine Heidi Fang I'm Dave Carney welcome to the program uh, Heidi let's start with you how, how did it go at the after party there at uh, lion fight 10 it was all kinds of fun dave uh you know i was in there dancing <laughs> and uh <laughs> doing a little bit of break dancing my coffee grinder is not what it used to be because i am a little bit older you know Stop the it. bones are a little creaky maybe i need a vitamin b shot from my That's friend yes Burke. exactly good good you plug know, <laughs> and a lot of potassium <laughs> i need some potassium well you know uh phil was telling a great story apparently uh, our lead reporter here got in a break dancing contest with a ufc fighter i don't know if we should keep him out of the news cycle right now but it, it was somebody that you you would probably know of so you missed out can, I, can I drop his name I mean well, sure, a bad thing. No, this guy he was good it's huh? Anthony Jaquani and yeah. he's a legitimate break dancer oh yeah he I mean, he's into the b-boy like Tracy Tracy Lee uh, she has a combat lifestyle website she takes photographs she's very known here in Las Vegas and worldwide um, so she follows MMA but she also follows uh, b-boys and, and break dancing and stuff and and she's done a lot of photo shoots with him and I'm talking photo shoots where he's like upside down on one hand doing the splits in the air you know like this guy can get down so the fact that Heidi steps in the cage Put the, the, the break dancing cage and got down, man. She's got some stones. She's got some stones okay, there. Okay, let me tell you something. I've never seen anything <laughs> like this before in my life. I walk into the after party and there's about you know twenty to forty. I don't know. There was a lot of people in a circle and they're going nuts and I have no idea what's going on and I <laughs> squeeze my way in and there's Anthony Shinquani and Heidi breakdance battling like I've never now I'm from the Bronx dude that doesn't happen but no matter what you think that stuff happened in the 80s okay now what happens if you try yeah. to dance get it and dance off with somebody you get shot. You're probably going to get, get mugged for now. your piece of parquet. And I could not believe. I've never seen anything like it. See, it was I, like, I, step it up. I'm from East San Jose, okay? I, I and that's what we do. breaking out the parquet, throwing it down on the ground. You know what I mean? Dusting it off real quick. Throw him some salt. And he's like, who wants to get in a breakdown competition? Nah. Parachute pants, I'm ready to go. Ain't happening. Not Ain't happening. happening. But it happened the other night. It, w it was fun to watch. And I'll tell you, it started the lion fight after party. <laughs> <laughs> off with a bang. That's great. So, yeah, the Lion Fight After Party took place at the Ainsworth. Now, you guys were obviously looking forward to their uh, their taco selection. How did that all go? It, it all it all <laughs> The tuna well. tacos. Were those the hit of the party? The tuna tacos? Are, you had a always? pink taco on one side. You had the tuna taco on the other. And, then and me you right in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Phil's sandwich. That's right, Phil. But that's what, you know, a great thing about a taco is it's it's almost a sandwich, but not quite. You know, you got a little breathing room. So uh, great stuff down there at the joint inside the Hard Rock. And, of course, uh, we're going to be looking forward to, guys, Lion Fight 11 is going to be coming up September the 20th. Now, the thing that's going to be really special about this, it's going to be an outdoor event. The partnership between the D Las Vegas Lion Fight Promotions and the Fremont Street Experience is putting together the first ever nationally televised fight outside on the Fremont Experience. It's going to be amazing. And I think it actually might be the first nationally televised event of any kind well, that from the correct. Fremont Street Experience. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be off the charts. I mean, we had Scott in here a, a few times leading up to the last Lion Fight, and 
he was buzzing about it. We weren't allowed to talk about it because the deal hadn't been official, but he was so excited about it. And the guy, the people down at Fremont Street, they're really looking forward to it to give that Fremont Street experience the exposure that it needs because it really is. It's a blast down there. Yeah. And going to see Muay Thai fights on a Friday night, it's going to be a good time. Well, you know, guys, we live in a, in a great part of uh, of Las Vegas here. I mean, with of downtown the of we the world. We live in a great I, part of the world, well, You're Dave. right. We do. And Las Vegas is one of the best places in the world. The Fremont Street experience, like you said, though, uh, really deserves to get some sort of a light shine down there. The Neonopolis is even coming back. Okay, what had been a basically forgotten about part of downtown Las Vegas is actually getting uh, revitalized. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, Joey, let's start with you, though. Uh, Yadson Clive Fairtext picks up. The first Lion Fight Championship belt. How did you think the fight went against Chike Lindsay? I mean, it was really exciting fight. I'll tell you what, man. That first round, wow. I was like, wow. Chike, Chike looked Chike great. Yes, he did. And, you know, he came out so intense. He found his jab. He found his right cross. One of the crazy things that blew my mind and just showed you why Yatsen Klai is Yatsen Klai is he was throwing that straight right, and he followed it up with the right head kick. Now, it, this was a fight against Yatsen Klai is a southpaw, so that means his right hand's forward, and Chike's orthodox fighter so his left hand's forward and so the right leg of Chike has a direct path to the face of Yatsen Klai so the weapons you want to use when facing a southpaw is your straight right hand or that right head kick so once Chike established that straight right hand down the pipe immediately after two or three punches later he threw the straight right and right after it followed with the right head kick that cracked the, the dome shin bone to the dome of Yatsen Klai it echoed you saw sweat Bouncing off the head of Yadsen Klai. Everyone in the crowd flinched. The only person who didn't flinch was Yadsen Klai. I mean, he took it like a champ. He just kind of smiled and kept coming forward. But when that first round ended, I was like, man, this kid Chike is legit. Like, he's bringing it. And then, you know what? He faded, and Yadsen Klai turned the heat up. You know, and that's what a cha- that's that's the difference between a champion and, you know, a guy working his way up the championship level. Is, Yacht, is, is Yatsen Klai has his best in him, gets better as the rounds go on, and the third, the fourth, the fifth, you see him getting better each round, looking better, looking sharper, whereas Chike kind of faded. If Chike could have kept that pace up, could have stayed that fresh, that explosiveness, you know, keep with those combos the whole fight, he would have been the champ. He would have won that fight. But he, he, you know what they say? He blew his wad. He blew his wad in the first round, and uh, and from there it was Yatsen Klai's fight. Uh, that was well, actually, actually that, that was the wad getting blown. You know what? That's what you think. That's, a, that's, a, that's it's more of like a. That's what everyone thinks blow his wad came from, yeah. but it's actually a poker term. It yes, actually it came is. From poker. Yeah, that's right. Because you blew so, your wad of cash. Yeah. yeah so you, what you would say though, in the other way is he busted his nut a little early. He, little, he uh, certainly did. Well, and you know the thing is though too, I I gotta give uh, Chike a lot of credit because when you're coming in facing such incredible odds, and, and we talked to Chike pre-fight there uh, from the joint, you're facing these incredible odds. You know, obviously nobody expects you to win, and to come out undeterred and really take it to Yatsen Klai like he did. He was throwing that left hook very effectively in that first first round and, and like you said Joey he just ended up getting you know I, I guess getting out conditioned by the champion uh he, he couldn't muster up the strength to stay with him for those five rounds but it was a great fight and Chike looked very good yeah you, you talk about Chike and the adversity he had to deal with I mean we were talking to him before the fight and he seemed so calm so cool like it, it didn't even really matter and you got to think about it. I mean, leading up to it, all we did was talk about Yads and Clyde. Yeah. I mean, that's anybody was talking about was you know, Yads fighting, and that's uh, that's all that mattered, and it was Yad versus some dude. All right? But uh, Chike's on. He showed the resilience the other night, showed how hard he is. To st- you, you can't put him down. Real tough dude. I, and the adversity, we talked about that. You know, we talked about the sad situation with his girlfriend, and we didn't talk about that on the air, but off the air we were talking about it. This dude's girlfriend was killed in a kickboxing fight a few years ago. You know, well, as the result of not as the result in. of <laughs> right. no, she got knocked out and never right. woke up. Yeah, she got yeah. knocked out and died the next day. You know, and this is a guy who to be that close to it and yep. to still fight. I mean, man, that's he scary. Bl- he blames the promoters because the promoters did not have an ambulance on site. They weren't, and she got to the hospital like an hour or two after the incident. So there was nothing they could do. All right, and like you say, Joey, to be that close to it and to still go and to go in there against a guy like Yadsen Klai, and, and just you know, I don't have the nearly the experience. 
I'm not nearly the fighter that Yad is, but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to I'm going to do the best I can. Yeah. And he showed a lot of heart too. Sure he did. Gets, not just in fighting Yad, not just to bring it into it, but in the in the like I think end of the third, he got split open over his eye. Oh, he had and, some bad cuts. Yeah, yeah. And, and Yad was working those cuts with elbows, with punches, and they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But Chiki keep coming. You know, he showed resilience. He showed heart. You know, he didn't quit. He didn't slow down. So so kudos to him. Yeah, and the angles that Yad was coming from with those elbows, man, I mean, they were just elusive as hell. You couldn't see uh, wh where he was going to strike you from. He just got that power along with it, and uh, obviously a lot, lot more experience. So, I mean, overall, it was just an excellent main event. Well, it was it was exactly what you would have hoped for if you were a fan down there at the joint inside the Hard Rock, which, by the way, guys, excellent turnout at Lion Fight 10, a near sellout, a amazing event from start to finish, uh, and it was exactly what you would hope for as a promoter as well because when you have your inaugural title fight between such a legend like Yad Sinclair and somebody that's up and coming and as we talked to Christine Toledo there on Friday as well they want to promote the American kickboxer in this Muay Thai promotion especially so I thought Chike represented himself and Americans extremely well and it shows a lot of promise for what Lion Fight is doing now speaking of Lion Fight guys uh, and Phil I want to start with you on this one <clears throat> we also saw a great fight here between the co-main event okay and that was Tiffany Van Soost versus Lucy Payne. Quick fight. Your thoughts? Well, that was one thing that we were expecting. Well, I don't know if we were expecting a quick fight, but we were expecting a fast, aggressive fight. We Both girls, they come out. They, they're, they go balls to the wall. All right? They go, to, uh, they go ovaries to the wall. They don't stop. That's yeah, great. They, they don't stop. All right. So, would that be the uterus wall? <laughs> the uterus wall, exactly. But let me tell you, that's uh, Joey's thing. He's like, I'm always hitting that wall. What's that wall I'm hitting when I'm working out? Oh, that's right. You talked about, you know, the elbows of Yad. But talk about the elbows of Tiffany. Wow. Oh man, she unloaded. Unloaded. When, when Lucy buckled and and, and 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 keeled over, and you know, was that bending over at the waist? She just unloads this barrage. I mean, just viciousness and bad intentions. It, uh, the aggressive style we talked about, and and. It proved for, I mean, it was quick, but it was it was a fun fight. And you know what, too? Uh, be, before the fight, we talked about, you know, the the length, the reach of Lucy Payne. That was the, the enigma. How is how is Tiffany going to deal with that? And, you know, we talked about the two ways to deal with a, a long fighter. Either make it a foam move fight, you ever get in their chest, bury your head in their chest. But in tie boxing, it can be dangerous when you got a tall fighter and they're good in the clinch. Absolutely. The other way was to stay just outside of their reach and make them overcommit and use your footwork and angles to close the distance after they punch, after they, you know, so so it was coming into it, you're wondering how is Tiffany gonna deal with it? Is she gonna do one of those two things? Is she gonna get stuck on the outside like we saw happen to Jake Ellenberger yeah. against Roy McDonald where he just stayed right in Roy's distance where Roy could pick and pull with that jab? But she just beautifully she was right on the outside, light on her toes, Tiffany presses forward, she takes a half step back, Tiffany fires, I mean uh, uh, Lucy fires, and right as that punch just reach, reaches the, the the full extent of its distance Tiffany would hop in behind it, follow it back, hit it with big punches, and it's beautiful. Well, and you know, real quick, because I want to get Heidi's take on the state of women fighting, especially in Muay Thai, but uh, I, I thought Tiffany's vertical leap uh, was actually really impressive because when she was actually in, in one of the points, you know, in the first round, I mean, it ended about a minute and a half, uh, two minutes into the first round, but uh, as Tiffany lunged at Lucy, I mean, she got a good 24 inches off the ground and was able to land two punches and a kick before coming down <laughs> to the ground. And I thought that is really impressive. And you know, that really paid. Uh, homage to a lot of her soccer training, I think. I mean, that girl has got some incredibly strong legs. I Although mean, she's incredibly in strong legs. legs. Yeah. I thought that was an homage to Street Fighter. Well, it might have been, but I thought know. it was to Pride. <laughs> <laughs> soccer kicks. Looked, like, yeah. looked like something out of a video game, like Chun Li. There. So yeah. Heidi, let me let me ask you because you've spent a lot of time working with the Lion Fight Promotions. You've done some of their color commentary uh, at the fights in the past. What is your thought after Lion Fight 10, looking forward to the future, and then especially this women's division? I'd love to see another division. Uh, I don't know how much depth we'll be able to find, but I'm sure that there's plenty, being that Muay Thai is a worldwide sport. Uh, there's got to be another Tiffany out there somewhere that can represent in, like, you know, another weight class. I'd really like to see that, you know, division build as much as I would with the UFC. I'd eventually like to see a second division in both Muay Thai and MMA. But, I mean, what Tiffany represents for that promotion is absolutely 
absolutely outstanding. The way that she carries herself is already, like, before she even put that belt around her waist like a true champion. She has the charisma, she has the spark, and then she puts it all together inside the ring. And you can't ask for more than that from somebody that's representing and being the face of your women's division. No, I mean, it was a absolutely fantastic. Um, and, guys, before we go to a break, though, I want to talk about uh, one last fight here because this really was, to me, the surprise of the night. And that was a former Las Vegas native, Kevin Ross, going down against Matt Embry. Um, what do you think about this fight? He looked flat. He, the thing is, Kevin didn't come alive until halfway through the fourth round. And he stole the fourth and fifth round. It was, you know, three rounds to two. Um, but, but the first three rounds, he was flat. He was just kind of lackadaisical. lackadaisical. He was one step behind Embry. And in, in halfway through the fourth, you saw him come on. The speed difference, he was quick. He was elusive. He was putting his combos together. But he needed to do that in round one. And he was just just behind the eight ball. I don't know if it was his birthday or, you know, or, or, or what happened or he was just too too comfortable. Remember how comfortable he was beforehand? He had said he'd never, like, he. this is the most comfortable he had ever been You know, been because he didn't find Embry exciting. He didn't, you know, find his fight style exciting. Remember that? And he would rather fight somebody that he wanted to see fight and didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. And he just didn't, he didn't come alive until the end of the fight. You know, he didn't turn it on because once he started putting his stuff together, he was quicker. And another thing, too, is he didn't make the adjustments early. Embry started catching that kick right in the first minute of the first round and sweeping his leg. But Kevin kept throwing it and he kept catching it. And this is the thing where either your corner has to make the adjustment or you as a fighter have to be cognizant, present, and aware of what's going on, what's working, what's not working, and pull that weapon from your arsenal. Because the kicks weren't doing it for him, but the punches, when he was putting those punches together in later rounds and he was using his footwork and he was quick and explosive, that's where he had the advantage. And that's usually how I, I've seen Kevin fight in the past. That's what I expected out of him. And it just came too little too late. Well, what's cool is we will see him at Lion Fight 11. He is already booked. He will face the Japanese superstar Tetsuya Yamamoto. Wow, that's going to be fantastic. All right, well, we're going to take a really quick commercial break, take care of some business. When we come back, Joey, Phil, Heidi, going to break down UFC on Fox 8 as well as catch some sound clips that Heidi was able to get. So stay tuned right here to the MMA Fight Corner.
to the MMA Fight Corner. Fight Corner. On the all-new Sports 920. The Game. The Game. The Game. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here on YouTube today. We're, we're doing this thing. We're doing it on the Internet. We're preempted this afternoon on Sports 920 The Game, but we're still broadcasting here from the Sports 920 The Game studio in Las Vegas. Joey Varner, Phil Devine, Heidi Fang, your host, Dave Carney along with you. And, guys, when we were uh, just on the other side of this break, we were talking about Lion Fight 10. Uh, what a great time it was. Lion Fight 11, of course, coming up uh, in September, September 20th, live from the 3rd Street stage down right outside of the D uh, and under the canopy at Fremont Street Experience. So, uh, obviously, we're hoping to be a real big part of this event going forward. We loved what we were doing here uh, with Lion Fight 10, and it was just a really great show uh, all the way around. I know somebody else that had a great time down there, guys. Dr. Jason Burke of Hangover Heaven and VitaHeavenLV.com. He was sitting right down there, right around from where you were, Joey, right right in front of the stage, uh, getting in all of the action. I know he got to meet a lot of the fighters, uh, you know, a chance to talk to folks, and he really seemed like he was having a good time, which for a guy that spends all of his time making us feel better by curing our hangovers, I mean, really curing our hangovers and getting us back on track with those vitamin supplements, awesome to see Dr. Burke be able to step out, have a nice time, uh, and, and really, like I say, it, it looks, you know, from the sweat that could have been jumping over there, <laughs> he had the primo seats. It was man. like something out of uh, Superman when uh, yeah. he catches her, and she's he's like, don't worry, I got you. You got me. Who's got you? That was me with Dr. Burke the other night. You know, I was just like, you cure me, but who's going to cure you? That's right. <laughs> and he's fortunately like, yeah, I'm, I'm a stud athlete. I take care of it. Dude, you know what? I got to give a big thank you. Shout out to Scott Ken as well, promoter of Lion Fight Promotions. Not just not just because he put on one hell of a show. It was packed. It was awesome. There was punches, kicks, elbows, nonstop action from, from the beginning of the first fight of the night to the last bell ending the night. It was awesome. But also, so, you know, we got the media passes, so you guys went to the suite, and, and uh, I always like to kind of just look around, see if I can find an empty seat on the floor somewhere, just to just until someone comes, then I'll leave, you know, just take advantage of that pass so I can get right up close. Well, Scott sees me there, and he's like, nah, come on, come with me. Me and my buddy Four over there, and he pulls me up. He puts me front row. I'm talking like I, 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 you I were in your coach's sweat. corner. Yeah, I was talking in about the corner. I mean, Joey was necess <laughs> like nestled right up against Joey V's coach's corner, which – Interestingly enough, I want to transition with you, Joey, because we're going to break down UFC on Fox 8 right now. Uh, and we're going to have a coach's corner here coming up about UFC 163 in our next segment. But right now, guys, um, start with you, Joey. Tell me, how did the uh, event go for you? Did you have a great time? I can't wait to see on the, uh, you know, the DVR report, uh, you know, replay that I'm going to get on Phil's. But uh, how did it go for you? Oh, yeah, I did the, uh, the, the post-fight show, UFC on Fox 8 post-fight show for Fox 5 here in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, and it was funny because we usually do a pre-fight show, and they usually bring me on as an analyst. Well, they kind of structured a little differently. We got a new set. Kevin Bollinger, one of their lead guys, yep. they sent him to the event, so he was going to get all the fighters right after the fight, like before Ariel. You know, he would get him. So uh, we did the post-fight show, and then they brought me in as the, as the anchor, you know, as the co-host, sitting there side-by-side -side reading the teleprompter. And it was awesome, man. I had a great time. You know, it, it was fun. And I really liked the format because I didn't like the pre-show. I mean, I like doing the pre-show, but first of all, when I'm doing the pre-show, I'm missing the prelims. Right. But second of all is that you got to think from, from Fox 5's standpoint is that they're competing with FX, who's their affiliate, yep. for those prelims. So it makes more sense, you know, when we have these exclusive interviews, Dana White was on for us, Roy McDonald was on, uh, uh, DJ Demetrius Johnson was on. You know, we get them all first because of, you know, Dana's relationship with Fox 5 because it's, it's sponsored by Stations Casino because it is his hometown that, you know, we're going to retain more more viewers we're going to get more people sticking around to watch than when we're competing with uh with you know the the prelims yeah and i'm just a little surprised how much you loved it reading off a teleprompter that's not your style <laughs> i mean i don't know it, obviously you can tell when you listen to the show that, that none of this is prepared we just kind of go <laughs> off the cuff but i mean joey having to read off a prompter i mean I, i'm I'm in, I'm in awe you know what most, I'm in people, awe. most people are in awe because they didn't know i knew how to the read, read. Uh, yeah right. but I, actually i'll tell you what though i was like uh, I, i'm kind of a book nerd i love to read and like when i was a kid in school i'm you know when it's time to read out loud it was funny because i'm always like pick me to read out loud pick me and then after I, i'm done reading i'm like trying to get the teacher to pick the one kid that couldn't read because it's so funny. You're like, you're like, you're like, follow this, buddy. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. <laughs> you get ugly friends, so you always look much better. Not even that it's that, that it's follow this, buddy, but it was like, I had this one buddy, Pat Mignani. I know he's not listening. He's out in California. But, dude, he was, it was, 
he he couldn't read. It was so awkward, but it was hilarious. All of us are just dying. Like he's, st- 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 you the, know what? This is amazing. amazing. I, I was gonna friend. say it was so funny. He was so awesome. <laughs> he couldn't read. He was nuts. Right, and you know this is what we hear about in the anti-bullying campaigns of today. Okay, you can't get away with that stuff anymore. It's, That's it's, not bullying. That's encouragement. I'm encouraging you to learn how to read. The, the kid is now, of course, serving twenty to light in Chino. You know what I mean? So you know we'll take that for what it's worth. Uh, but Heidi, Phil, Joey, let's talk a little bit about UFC. On Fox 8, I mean, it was kind of a snoozer co-main event, uh, you know, but Phil, you know, take me through your thoughts. Well, that was the thing when uh, Joey mentioned earlier and the way Rory McDonald had used the jab to just pretty much stop Ellenberger in his tracks. It, it was hard for me to hold back any just disgusting words I had for the fight. Now, I am n- I'm one of the people who I absolutely hate. I hate when a crowd boos. I think it's the most disrespectful thing in the world. You have no idea what the guys go through to get in there. But you know what? I do not have a problem with the crowd booing the way they did for that fight. That was not, I mean, yes, Rory did what he had to do, but that that just just did not seem like a fight. It seemed like a Mamba session. Like that for eight weeks, these two guys to prepare for each other took dance lessons. Well, you know what? It's from Rory's side, okay? His strategy was obvious. Whether Jake was no matter what Jake was going to do, he was going to use his length, use his range and his distance and fire that long jab from far away. Great great game plan, but in order to be an exciting fight, the other fighter that you're using that game plan against has to really bring it, has to explode in, you know, has to come forward and press that action so that then you're firing a lot more jabs, not just an occasional jab because really Rory's, Rory's strategy was to counter with that long jab uses reach. And you can't counter if the person's not engaging. To Jake, this reminds me of the Matt Emery uh, Kevin Ross fight and not in the way not in the styles of course but in the fact that in the fifth round Jake comes our fourth, third fourth, round, yeah. excuse me, fifth, fourth, third, whatever it is. However, I, I can't count. The last round. I, I told you I can round. read. I, I just can't count. count. Yeah. yeah. In the third round, Jake comes alive. He starts exploding with combinations, changing his levels. He gets the takedown, you know. Where was that guy in the first two rounds, you know? That round one or round two, once Rory snapped his head back with that first jab, he stayed there. He stayed right in Rory's range. He didn't disengage a little bit to create more space. He didn't come in more to jam the punches and take away space. He stayed in that range and kind of didn't do anything, you know. And Rory's jab was very effective, but I wanted to see something. I, he's the juggernaut. You expect when someone's name is the yeah. juggernaut, you expect them to go juggernauts on. <laughs> I, don't know, uh, I don't know if that's the appropriate uh, term there. Uh, nuts. Yeah, yeah. juggernauts. Yeah. Thank, going thank you. Going juggernauts. Instead, he went juggalo. Yeah, like, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> he couldn't get his wrestling in. And I was like, where is that NCAA wrestler that we all know and yeah. you know, have loved? But and or, or even that heart of the Marine. I mean, he's been in the military as well and like I don't know this is like the go trigger just wasn't there for him on, on, on uh, Saturday PTSD, night man. In, in order I mean, to use that, that, that wrestling he had to really do what he he had to unload he had to come fire big punches Set close that strikes. distance throw some bombs and then shoot from there and he didn't do that he stayed at that range and but one thing too was the uh, the adjustments that weren't made you know he wasn't moving his head he wasn't slipping he wasn't counting he wasn't staying busy he just kind of stopped in that range I think Rory's jab my boxing coach you say tell me back in the day that that your jab it's it's like it's supposed to be a power punch you're supposed to hit them with that jab you snap their head back and then their head they go Oh my God, that was a jab. I don't want to feel any of the punches. And you saw that first jab land from Roy McDonald in the face of Jake Ellenberger. It snapped back Jake's head, and he froze. And I think that's exactly what happened. Where Jake was like, "Damn, that's his jab. I don't want to taste anything else." Yeah, I, I think one of the big things was that you knew that Jake went home that night and he was not happy with himself. You know, he's going to look back at that performance and, and what the hell happened. And, and you're, you're absolutely right, Joey. He probably he didn't want to taste that jab anymore. Did it threw him his. Com- Game cam completely off, all right. But the the hype of the fight, the 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 talk these two guys had beforehand leading up, the way that Jake was just humiliating Rory McDonald on Twitter, you know. And Dana White said it best in his post in the post fight. He said fighters that talk shit before a fight, all the talk, the fight usually sucks. And, and you know, most of the time. Unfortunately, most of the time he's right. You know, sometimes we do get one, but you, you, when there's so much hype leading up to a fight, sometimes, and Rogan even said it during the fight, he says, you know, we, when this fight was announced, everyone was like, so excited. This was going to be such an amazing fight. Two top welterweights going at it. 
possible title implications on the line. That's but all gone. Secretly, <laughs> yeah, right. But secretly, you're hoping it's not a snoozer. And he said that during the broadcast. You know, that was m- my analogy uh, uh, on the post-fight show was that it's it's was the fight that bad or is that we expected so much out of it? Because, for instance, the Jay Huron jay Kellenberger fight played out very similar. There was not a lot of action. You know, Jake wasn't engaging. He was kind of doing enough, you know. But but you, when you talk about snoozers and you get condemned, and that was a main event on a televised card, you didn't hear too much about that. There wasn't so much criticism. There was a little. But I think with this one, it's like the movie. It's like your boy tells you, you got to go see this movie. It's the greatest thing. It's the great. And so your expectations are built up. You're so excited. And then you see it. And it's, and it's Waterworld. And you're like, what is this shit? You know, you're like, this is a horrible movie. Good thing you said Waterworld and not the Postman. Because that movie oh, please. Awesome. You know, another. <laughs> sto- I read the book and then I saw the movie and I thought the movie was deplorable. But uh, let's stay right here, though. And, and, and Joey, I'll flip it back to you. And then I want to come to Heidi and Phil again. Uh, the main event. So DJ gets his first finish in the UFC. How did you take this after the fight? Good for him. Kudos. About time it came. But you know what I was most surprised with? I, it wasn't that DJ, who on paper was the less qualified wrestler, John Morgan, uh, uh, John Moraga, John Morgan. <laughs> I don't think he's wrestling anybody anytime soon. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. Um, John Moraga. Uh, you know, two-time All-American NCAA wrestler out of Arizona. He's got the wrestling pedigree, and he got out-wrestled from, from, from the moment go, from the word go. You know, Dietrich, Demetrius Johnson was able to hit those takedowns, but what was even more surprising to me was that I thought Demetrius would be able to pick him apart on the feet as well, but Moraga was doing the damage. Moraga had his number in the stand-up. He actually looked better in that stand-up, and I think that's why Demetrius went to the wrestling, but when it hit the mat, you saw Demetrius not just with the advantage in the wrestling game, but in grappling overall. He, he was working on that Kimura. He was working on submissions. You know, he secured side control fairly easy, and it's good to see him get the finish. Yeah, a lot of people leading up to the fight had said some some disparaging things about Morago off his back, and we did see it, but uh, you saw Demetrius working that arm the entire fight he was going for. But you know what it reminded me as far as like when you're talking about the wrestling pedigree? Remember when, uh, was it, not Mendez, Joseph Benavidez. Joseph Benavidez was supposed to go up, went up against Dominic Cruz. Cruz took him down like 15 times in the fight at will, and each one was just such a dev- – like, it w- it looked so devastating, you know, and that's the way it was with Moraga. So, I mean, every time he got taken down, it was so fast, so hard. I, I, kudos to Demetrius Johnson, not only for getting the finish, all right, but just for – a, an outstanding fight, really an outstanding fight from top to bottom. Well, yeah. and I was going to say one person that I know actually thought maybe John Moraga was going to take this fight. Uh, yeah, that was me, actually. Well, uh, you and Heidi. I mean, really? I was talking to, I was, I I was talking to Heidi it? there. and was going to knock him out. Well, Heidi, tell me what, you know, because Heidi had an you interesting take on this. Nonsense. But, you know, you did. You had an interesting take on this. What was your thought behind what you saw in John and why you thought maybe he was ready to beat Demetrius? Well, he was so hungry. He had a lot of power. And uh, a lot of times with that drive and with you put together in training camp can really make the difference but you know Demetrius just ended up outclassing him he had some incredible takedowns like Phil was saying I mean he landed 12 for 12 that was exact, uh, perfect in what he was doing uh, and setting him up. He was using his strikes to get them. you know. And then there was the one I was like, okay, now I know why they call him flyweights because he actually just kind of lifted him up <laughs> and threw him like halfway across the cage like, dude, and like, took him down. And yeah, he literally flew on one of those later takedowns and it was totally amazing. But you know, um, with Moraga, d- you know, he training with Benson Henderson at the lab, you know, I thought that with the champion, you can also find that way to become a champion. And, you know, Unfortunately, it didn't pan out, but he'll be back. Yeah, definitely. And and like you know, Joey asked, how, how did I think Moraga was going to win? I thought he was. I thought he was going to knock John, uh, Demetrius, Demetrius out. out. I really think he d- he was. Um, but you really saw Demetrius Johnson. That's two fights in a row now where you've seen him get clocked. He got hit hard. I mean, there was that shot where he got hit. He got thrown back against the cage. I thought it was going to be over right then and there. Johnson can take a shot. Demetrius Johnson yeah. can take a punch. No, he's 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 definitely got a you know a, a strong countenance. I would say in that regard, he he was able to withstand uh, you know some stuff. But guys, real quick because we've got some elements that I want to play here. Heidi was able to get some sound uh, with. Uh, now these guys are obviously the superstars of the UFC. Extremely tough guys. Uh, the first one here, Heidi, is a clip you got with George St. Pierre. So why don't you lead us into this one? All right. Well, um, we had the UFC World Tour yesterday at the MGM Grand Garden. Uh, 
lobby. So we were all out there, and you know, GSP. We had actually spoke about um, you know Johnny Hendricks, his power, how he plans to you know get in there and attack. So here's GSP on the impending UFC 167 fight. Obviously, this is a big title defense for you. It's number nine. Uh, what are your thoughts so far on Johnny? He's a great fighter. He's the best guy right now, and uh, I'm happy to fight him. It seems that uh, already you've already devised a game plan, thinking that maybe he's not so difficult as far as what he brings to the table with his left power hand and also uh, with his wrestling. What do you think about uh, the game plan that you're working on for him? He's a very dangerous fighter, and uh, he brings uh, a lot of problems on the table. He's very powerful, very athletic, and he's a great wrestler. Great striker, so he's very well rounded. It's gonna be a very it's probably the biggest challenge of my career. <clears throat> now a lot of people are saying that. They're you know, with, well, similar to Weidman with Silva, it's very similar with Hendricks with you. A lot of people view this as one of the major tests of your career. And uh, you kinda you kinda touched on that, but what makes him so dangerous for you? He's very well rounded and he's got knockout power, he's a very great a great accomplished wrestler. He's very skilled, you know. He's very athletic too. He's a mix of athleticism and skill, and uh, I'm excited for the fight. This is the first time that you've fought it for a long time uh, outside of Canada. What are your thoughts on being uh, here in Las Vegas for the title fight? It's been probably the first time in what, a few years. I'm very excited. Is I start my career in UFC here, and uh, that's a place I fought the most in my life. It's in Vegas. So I fought more time in Vegas than anywhere else in the. In the in the, in the world, you know. So I'm very excited to go back in Vegas. It's my favorite place to fight in, in the world is Las Vegas. It's a capital fighting, is a fighting capital city of the world. And uh, very, uh, there's something very special about this city. And uh, the vibe is, uh, everything is, is very, uh, it's very special. I'm very excited for this fight. Do you think the fact that he's a Southpaw presents a problem? It's a problem. Like any other problem that you bring on the table, I fought Sapo before. I'm gonna make uh, myself the mo I'm gonna prepare myself the best I can and uh, make the best I uh, do, do the best I can do. Well, uh, for the TriStar, for us, a hobby, you guys always have a way of bringing in specialized training partners for the camps as you find necessary. Who do you plan maybe to bring in for this one? Well, I'm gonna spar with a lot of boxer. Uh, professional boxer that are uh, Salpa, very high level. We bring some other guys. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna work on this uh, during the next couple uh, weeks. All right, and that, uh, of course, was George St. Pierre. Heidi getting some uh, great sound there uh, with George. George has got a great accent, man. I, I really love that. You know. I, I I am not impressed by his accent. You're not. Dude. No I man, I'm not. I'm not. I think, I think the it, French Canadian type thing is is awesome. It's you know what? At first, years ago, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And now it's just like annoying. Like it's like nails on chalkboard. I'm like, oh my god, you sound they're like just angry because chicks dig it. No, not, right. it, not at all. <laughs> like, yeah, man, I don't. I don't care what. Listen, I'm just. Gonna, I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you what. What you know on, U on UFC Undisputed 11. Uh, I, my son, who's eight years old, cannot touch me when I'm when I'm using the George St. Pierre character. So that's all I'm gonna say. Great guy. I, I, love I the accent. I hope he can't touch you anywhere because that's just inappropriate. Listen, first off, let me just say. <laughs> Daddy, uh, whatever, you know. you take it there. I'm not Father uh, Carney. I'm just Dad. <laughs> Daddy Carney. Uh, well done. Speaking of Father Carney, do you know what Pope stands for? Oh, geez. No. What? Protector of pedophiles everywhere. I love it. That's fantastic. That was always my favorite. My uncle's a priest, and I used to always catch him with that. Sure. Hey, do you, you always used to uh, catch him. Huh? Catch him. <laughs> I, used to, I used to catch him with that. Hey, uh, why do altar boys all have hair parted in the middle? He's like, I don't know why. And I was like, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on that note, we're going to take a really, really quick commercial break. We're going to say hi to our friends over at Hangover Heaven and Vita Heaven LV. And we'll be right back on the MMA Fight Corner.
Quarter. White Quarter. On the all-new Sports 920. The game. The game. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner, broadcasting from the Sports 920 studio here in Las Vegas, but coming at you on this very special edition online. We're a little out of control today and running over time, so we've got some stuff, and we are going to burn through it. It's been a great show. Uh, On the other side of this break, we were just talking about uh, UFC on Fox 8. Of course, we are all looking forward to UFC 163 coming up August 3rd in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I, like I could see, I could keep fan. going, but you know that's that's okay. We've already got Michael Buffer doing that commercial. He says his larynx hurt or something like that. Uh, but we still have lots of stuff to cover here, guys. Uh, in a minute, we're going to be going through a Joey V's coach's corner. Joey's going to break down one of the prelim fights on the UFC 163 card. But right now, Heidi, uh, I want you to set up this other piece of sound you got with Johnny Hendricks. So we heard from George St. Pierre, but now we're going to hear a little bit from Johnny Hendricks. Yeah, you know, Johnny is actually really looking forward to this. It's been a long time coming for him and uh, uh, he's really really excited about the fight getting his training partners together he actually did a little bit with the Texas Rangers we did not discuss this in that particular piece but it is online at MMA Fight Corner under the interviews but uh, here's Johnny and he's talking all about GSP and here's Johnny <laughs> fighting all I've been doing is watching footage training you know training here and there uh, trying to get uh, certain things better of my own before I really get into this fight. Uh, and, you know, uh, August 12th, I'll be, that's whenever I'll start deciding, you know, what do we do to get to the fourth and fifth rounds. Now, of course, without watching any tape and having really dissected it, we already know that he has the wrestling strength. He has that jab that he can work from the outside. He has a tremendous amount of speed. Where are you feeling that your advantage lies in this fight? I feel like I'm stronger. You know, uh, I feel like I'm faster. I know I hit harder, um, and my wrestling is better. You know, I'm going to go out there and say my wrestling's better. Uh, You know, you don't, uh, just because it's MMA, it's a little bit different, but uh, these things help takedowns. Nobody's going to let me throw a punch and not keep their hands up. So in return makes shooting easier. See, I'm I'm the diff, I'm a different fighter than he is. He's a guy who wants to sit back, wait, wait, wait. As soon as you ex- extend yourself, he's gonna come underneath. I'm the guy that's gonna move forward, make you put hands in your face, make you react, and however you react, that's the way I'm gonna go. Of course, we all know about the power left. Are you gonna try to work on the right arm and get that as much already, power? I already have. I, I hit uh, I hit a power meter. I'm only ten behind my left. Wow. Yeah, with my right hand. Uh, and I've been using my la- right hand more than my left. Uh, and I've been... Almost I've, like Rocky II in the rematch. Yeah, I've, I've pretty much been uh, I've been pretty much hurting some people, you know? But uh, it, it, it needs to be done because I, uh, I have to, and I've yet to throw it hard because I want my training partners to keep coming back in a sense. So uh, I, 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 I throw it with some bad intent but not to kill mode. Now you've discussed that your power saying that you haven't put 100% out in the cage because you want to stay ready for fights you don't want to have a broken hand when you go in against GSP how much do you anticipate with that hype and everything that adrenaline going into that fight how much power do you think you could possibly use in that fight? Uh, I'm gonna try to use everything I got you know uh, I've, I've been conserving it because of this right here you know, this is the this is the fight that you have to let everything go. You know, I want to walk away, win or lose. I left everything in the octagon. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and this is going to be the fight that I let everything go. Um, broken hand or not, my hands have finally gotten to where they can withstand my power, uh, hitting 100%. Uh, that's what I was sort of waiting for is my bone density and everything to get to where it can withstand everything. So. Uh, now it's just about going out there and just sharpening up little things, you know, my hook, body shots, head kicks, you know, takedowns, uh, and letting it all fly whenever time comes. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. That was a little live listen-in from the UFC World Tour. Heidi was able to get some sound with Johnny Hendricks, George St. Pierre. And Heidi, we actually might be sending you out on assignment. I'm going to throw this out there as a manifestation for the universe. But uh, as these things come and you're able to get these great interviews, uh, we're going to try to get you wherever they're going to go on this World Tour because it is just going to be an amazing way for the UFC to brand itself, much like the NFL does, the NBA, Major League Baseball. Great idea for them. 
them. And uh, of course, we want to, you know, we want to get you out of here. Well, let's just say we had an interested party that works with the show who said, why didn't you go down to L.A.? You got to go talk to Rhonda. Why didn't you go talk to Rhonda? You can so he Rhonda? said, let's go talk to Rhonda. Uh, did you just like <laughs> try to secret it? Like, I'm going to put this out in the universe so hopefully it matters. That's right. Absolutely. You're trying to secret it? You betcha. All right. You all betcha. Right, you, know, you know how I'm going with that. Absolutely. You know what I mean? We've, we've got to throw that energy out there. Uh, but uh, not to divert too far from where we're going because, you know, UFC World Tour, obviously big, big news. Uh, but the next big UFC fight is UFC 163, August 3rd in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Now, Joey, you've got a Joey V's Coach's Corner. You're going to be breaking down one of the prelim fights of this card. So let's get ready for Joey V's Coach's Corner. Now, get inside the cage with a true warrior. It's Joey V's Coach's Corner. Little, uh, throwing a little Yachts and Clyde elbows. Of course, I'm sh- of course, I'm shadow boxing when the song comes on, but I had to mix in some Yachts and Clyde elbows. I got you know? that on video this yeah, time. That's what he does every time. You might have to slow it down just to watch it because it was that fast. It float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, but Joey's only tall enough to hit you in your knee. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Well done. So, Coach's Corner, we're going to break down a battle between two grappling sensations, two Abu Dhabi, com- Abu Dhabi combat championship winners. Anthony Perroche taking on Pezal, Vinny Magalhães. And we all know what happens when two grapplers step in the cage and to tussle. It becomes not a grappling match, a striking match. Which I'll tell you what, if you're Vinny Magalhães, you're loving this. If you're Anthony Perroche, you're not. Anthony Perroche, most of his losses, he has seven losses. Five of them have come by way of knockout. This is not where he wants the fight. If he's going to get this W in hostile territories, mind you, he's going down to Rio to take on a Brazilian. And we all know that Brazilians in Brazil win 80% of the time. So it's a tough task. It's it's a big mountain to climb. But if he wants the W, he's got to be able to get this fight to the ground, but not on Vinny's terms, on his terms. He has to take down Vinny. He has to control the top position. He's much more effective in the top position than he is on bottom. And when you're in a grappling contest, Perosh is one of the best grapplers, not from Brazil. Vinny's one of the best grapplers on the planet Earth. So when you're in that grappling contest with him, you're going to have a much better, uh, a higher chance of success when you're in that top position. But Vinny is still dangerous there. We've seen him hit a go-go plata before from bottom. This is virtually unheard of, and the fact that he hit it in the MMA fight just shows you that this guy is dangerous anywhere this fight goes. Perosh needs to get it to the ground, but maintain that top position. Vinny, he's worked a ton on his striking. He's come a long way. He's got some head kick knockouts. You know, he said in his last fight he was struggling to rebound because his trainer, Mark Beecher, had moved to college. Colorado, and, and now he's found uh, a suitable coach, Chaz Mulkey, who's actually a Mark Beecher protege who strikes just like Mark Beecher, so he's got his, a striking coach with that same style of striking. He's feeling confident. He's feeling comfortable. I think on their feet, Vinny has the advantage. Perosh's weakness is the, the inability to take a punch or a kick or a knee or an elbow. His chin is suspect. He's been slept. He's been knocked out five out of seven times. I think Vinny does it again, goes for that knockout, and makes it a quick night for Anthony Perosh. Wow, well done, uh, Joey V's coach's corner, and and I've got to say I'm super excited now for this fight. We, I mean, we talked to Vinny Magliani uh, last week here on the MMA Fight Corner, and you know one thing that stood out for me, Joey and Phil, is the fact that Vinny's very aware of where he stands in UFC mind right now. He he understands that he doesn't have a lot of wiggle room when it comes to this fight. That he has got to put on a very impressive show now. You add on to that the fact that he's in Brazil, and I was going to ask you guys, do you think that even though the, the, the percentage of winning for a Brazilian in Brazil is so high, does this put extra pressure on Vinny to win this fight and win it in a dominating fashion? Uh, you know, I look at this fight, and I look at Vinny leading into this fight, and I honestly think he's in the right mindset. I think when you look at Anthony Perosh, I think Vinny in all aspects of the game is just better. Uh, grappling... Ten times better, and and Perosh, hey Perosh, may, maybe you know what one of the first black belts out of Australia. It doesn't matter. Vinny is a multiple time world champion, top of his game, probably the best jujitsu practitioner in the light heavyweight, a heavyweight division, maybe even in the well in the middleweight division. Vinny's top of the of the food chain. He's top five grapplers in the world. In the world, yeah, and I think he so and and like Joey mentioned, the stand up. I think it's perfect. I don't think Vinny was ready to pick a fight with Phil Davis the way he did. I know he wanted a top 10 opponent after his win over uh, Pekriak, but he, he, it, not yet. I think give Vinny a little bit more time. 
Vinny's, Vinny's a great fighter. And Vinny's going to do good things in the UFC. And I think this is the perfect fight for him to get back on his winning ways. And I'll tell you what. Both these guys' heads are on the chopping block. Yes. But the thing is, is that... You don't hear much out of Parosh. Vinny knows it. Vinny knows what it feels like to get cut. When he lost to Elliot Marshall, his second loss in the octagon, he was cut. He went out there. He put a streak together. He was rallying after every win to get back in the UFC. He wants to be here. He doesn't want to leave again. He fought his butt off, not just physically in the cage, but with marketing, with social media, with Twitter, with his manager to get back in that cage. And now he knows. He's made it abundantly clear. He went out and said there, hey, my ass is on the line here. I lose this. I got cut. I don't want to do that. Peros is on the, in the chopping block too, but he's not He's not as vocal about it. He's not as talking about it. He wasn't doing what Vinny did to get back in the cage. So I think this is just Vinny does not want to go. Vinny in his mind is fighting for his life. Yeah, And, and that makes it a different fight. And, and Peros has been in the UFC on and off before. Peros has been cut I think twice before. Right. So you know coming back. For him and this is nothing new. Vinny does not want to have that happen to him again. Uh, no and that was made to us abundantly clear and uh, uh, like I say, I want to talk to Vinny again after this fight to kind of, you know, judge how he feels uh, post-fight because I'm thinking that he is also going to dominate this fight from start and to finish. It's just, you know, something about the way that he was speaking of it. And the other night we saw him over at Lion Fight. He had a nice seat sitting up front. But when he walked in, he came over. He said hello to all of us. But when he walked away, I noticed the amazing shirt he was wearing. <laughs> oh, that shirt was I don't know money. how many people know the story between him, but Hanato, Laranja, and him, whatever, they, they have this tw Twitter thing going on. Find it if you don't know what's going on. It's been highly entertaining, but he was walking around wearing a Laranja shirt, the 26th time world champion, <laughs> Hanato Laranja. <laughs> well, you know what's funny as well about Vinny being in Brazil is because Vinny actually took a lot of heat from Brazil yes, he because did. because he was the coach to Chael Sonnen. So here's a guy who is Brazilian, but a lot of Brazilians don't like, but lucky for him, He's Brazilian in Brazil and, against and the non-Brazilian. they're going to go for so it, it anyway. Yeah, so no. if, it was, if it was another case where he was fighting another Brazilian, I think he'd be on the receiving end of those boos. But because it's a non-Brazilian, he's the champion. He's the hero. He gets him anyways. And it's, it's where he's from. Yeah, a absolutely. And, I mean, it's going to be a great card, uh, great fights all the way around. We are getting a bit tight here on this extended edition of the MMA Fight Corner. Again, full interviews of GSP and, of course, Johnny Hendricks available online at MMAFightCorner.com and always available on MMA Fight corner.com is this week in MMA history. So Phil, we're going to transition now and go into this week in MMA history part oon. Check out the big brain on Phil. Now, here's the biggest brain in the biz, Phil Devine, with this week in MMA history. It's my bro. That's right. All right, well today is July 30th and well 2 years ago on this date Dan Henderson knocked out Fedor in the first round, handing the Russian legend his third straight defeat and only technical knockout of his career. Misha Tate also became the new women's bantamweight champion when she submitted Marlos Kunin that night with an arm triangle in the fourth round. Now, also, August 3rd, 2008, WEC 35 Condit vs. Miura. Three titles on the line that night, and two of them would be for the very last time because, uh, as everyone knows, a few months later, Zufa dissolved the heavier divisions. Well, lightweight champion Jamie Varner defended his title, stopping Marcus Hicks by TKO in the first round. In the last light heavyweight championship fight for the WEC, Steve Cantwell defeated Brian Stan by second round TKO to become the new and last WEC light heavyweight champion. And in the main event, Carlos Condit defended his welterweight title when he finished Hiro Mitsumiura with strikes with 15 seconds remaining in the fourth round. Condit then ended his WEC career, a perfect 5-0, and with the company, and he was their last welterweight champion. Now, August 1st, 2010, UFC Live, Jones vs. Matyushenko. It was the second event the UFC held on the Versus channel. It had to actually be moved from Salt Lake City to San Diego due to poor ticket sales. So that just goes to show you that, you know, while we think we're, we're at where we are with, with, uh, with MMA in, the, in society, there are still places where you're not okay. that much of a ticket sale. I'm, I'm going to uh, throw this out there like, Salt Lake like baseball and, you know, Babe Ruth or whatever home run records, you know, asterisk, sorry, you know, can't have it. 
That's Salt Lake City. It doesn't even really count. Oh, come on. No. Come on. It's a sub-American con- uh, country, okay? I'm going to say but that. But they it, wear magic underpants. But it's like Jacksonville shouldn't really have a football team. Absolutely. We're talking about that You're before the show. You're talking about Jacksonville. <laughs> well, all right. Well, they had to move from Salt Lake City to San Diego. Uh, that night, John Jones stopped Vladimir Machyshenko with a barrage of devastating elbows in under two minutes. Yushin Okami took a split decision win over Mark Munoz. Jake Ellenberger picked up a win over John Howard when doctors were forced to stop the fight in the third round when Howard's eyes swole shut. That was shut. so nasty, dude. He looked like E.T., dude. No, he, <laughs> he looked like E.T. was going to hatch out of his eye. <laughs> Bro, it was so – it was like – I can't even f- f- find an it analogy. Was, it to was do really it bad. It, it's one of those ones you have to see it. If you like, you know, when we talk about Jose Aldo and his devastating double flying knee to Cub Swanson and the what happened with there, or or the Marvin uh, Marvin, Marvin Eastman, Eastman re- receiving Vitor. the Vitor knee and look like he has a big red slug across his forehead. Absolutely. Ch- Google the image, John Howard. It may be the first thing that pops You're up. You're like, is that a Sigourney Weaver fetus coming out uh, of your head? What movie is this it, from? It, it was <laughs> bad. It was bad. Um, fight of the night that night went to Brian Stan and Mike Masenzio, a fight that Stan won when he submitted Masenzio in the third round. Knockout of the night went to Takanoris Gomi for his knockout in the first round of Tyson Griffin. And the submission of the night went to Charles Oliveira when he submitted Darren Elkins with an arm bar in under 45 seconds. Well, afterwards, Elkin did the right thing. He dropped down to 145, and he was on quite a tear until he ran into Mendez. But that was the only loss he suffered in the UFC up until the Mendez fight. And that is all we have in this week in MMA history. Wow. Well, you know, I've got to say that's, I mean, that's a perfectly timed this week in MMA history. Uh, guys, this has been a really, really fun extra edition of the MMA Fight Corner. And again, you can always find the latest and greatest in MMA news right there on our website, MMAFightCorner.com. Uh, now, guys, also this Friday, we will be off air here on Sports 920 The Game. Uh, we are preempted for some 51s baseball. And again, the 51s are doing fantastic right now have been really really on a hot streak so congratulations to them thank you very much i know joey likes the 51s he's a big fan don't worry we've got extra tickets it. we've got extra tickets it coming like for you what he was doing was not the batting 51s. practice it was the five knuckles shuffle <laughs> <laughs> hey you know what this is one of those things if we're ever uh, allowed to do a full show like we would have on a Sirius or uh, an hbo or something like that i i think we could even take this further uh, <laughs> I we think definitely we, could we could take this a bit further when so i was on Sirius, the things that you were able to say were amazing it was amazing Bro, can't imagine me on serious <laughs> you know part of the fun though of this guys and this is the howard stern thing all the way the fun of it is almost skirting around it you know when when your enemy is the fcc and you have to always uh watch what you're saying it makes it so much more interesting it makes it so hard for me to speak I don't think so. I think you do a fine, clean job, and apparently Thank Fox you. 5 thinks so as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and post some of those pictures later on on my own separate Facebook page, and we're going to tag Joey in a lot of unflattering ways. But that's all right. It's all in good fun, and this has been a fun show. So for Joey Varner, Phil Devine, Heidi Fang, I'm Dave Carney, and we'll see you guys soon on the MMA Fight Corner.